world is changing, and if we continue on our traditional approach to the way we sell, we'll be overrun by our competitors. We need to change the way we sell. So this topic today is really important. It's a transformation we all need to think about, and I'm sure Graham's going to put a lot of insight to the table to help us think it through, and then let's have a good panel discussion after that. Graham, please thank come up. Thank you, John. Come back to you. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, John, for that kind introduction, and uh, thank you all for being here. Great to see so many familiar faces. Um, quite a few old colleagues here, a few partners and suppliers, and quite a few familiar faces from LinkedIn as well, although the faces look different in real life, don't they? Um, thank you, John. Um, I have to say that the, the term thought leader doesn't sit very well with me, I have to say. Um, I don't consider myself to be a thought leader at all, really. What I am actually is an aggregator of other people's ideas and concepts. In writing the two books, I've spent better part of five years now researching and anyone that's written a book will tell you you do more reading than you do writing. So I've read a lot, I've been out and spoken with a hell of a lot of customers and everything I do and say in my, my daily life now and certainly the Masterminds group is all about this here which is voice of customer. And so you know the, the, the buyer feedback that I've had over the, the course of the journey has really influenced where I'm headed with uh, the future of the sales profession. So with all of this change, and Bridget, I think, outlined it very nicely, the buyer has changed dramatically, right? Everyone agrees with that. The thing that really strikes me, though, is who do we listen to? Who do we, who do we go and talk to? And as I mentioned, for me, it's the buyer. Those of you that follow me on LinkedIn may have seen this post that I put out recently, slightly facetious, where I said, don't listen to this guy. Um, don't listen to sales thought leaders. Just go out and ask your buyer how it is that they want to buy. And for me, that's been a wonderful source of feedback on you know, getting, not talking to sales thought leaders, not talking to sales people, just understanding the buyer. Um, now, what made this really quite funny is um, no sooner had I, had I pressed publish on this post, but I, my phone rang. And uh, it was Kean McLaughlin. And Kean, I'm sorry, mate, but I, I don't do a very good Irish accent. But, <laughs> but Kean said to me, oh my God, Graham, I just saw your photo come up on my news feed. And I thought someone was having a go at you. But clearly it wasn't someone having to go at me, it was me who'd written it. And um, it was facetious, but it was all designed to say, listen to your buyer. It was about understanding how the buyer wants to buy and using that as your, your feedback. So, I mentioned to Ken before, I've got a ton of content that I'd like to share and I've had to try and trim it back. We're gonna break it up into three sections. First section is context. And I think this is an area where we as salespeople because we're all so busy and under so much pressure now for end of month, end of quarter, and all of the, the metrics that we're trying to measure, I'm going to talk a little bit about the thing that we don't do, and that is we don't step back. We don't zoom out and have a look at the environment around us and what's driving all of this change. So I'm going to spend some time going through some of that. Then we'll talk about the implications for all of us as salespeople and what that means, what the context's driving. Then we'll get into four recommendations that I'll make at the end that hopefully will help people get an idea of where I think the future of sales is going. Just before we move on, quick show of hands. Sales leaders in the room? Sales leaders, yep, great. So quite a quota carrying sales people, quite a few. Any marketing folks? Yep, a couple. Product management, any product management? HR, finance, no. Good, okay, excellent. So, context. Let's talk about how things have changed in the last 10 years. When we go back to 2007, I, I use 2007 as a bit of a landmark because that's when the iPhone was first released. Think about that for a minute. 10 years ago, none of us knew what an app was. The other important thing that happened just prior to 2007, 2006 in fact, was Amazon Web Services. And that ushered in the era of cloud and consumption-based economics. That's a huge change. So, in that time, we've moved from vendor push to customer pull business models. We've moved from being customer aware to being customer led. I think everyone will agree with that. I think, um, you know, Bridget mentioned this one before, and I think this is probably the biggest change that we've seen in the last 10 years by, by far is information parity. When your buyer has the same amount of information at their disposal as you do as the vendor, and they can solve their own problems, that really calls into question the role of the salesperson, doesn't it? 
So information parity is a big one for me. We've moved from interruption-based marketing to permission-based marketing. Everybody knows that. We, buyers don't like to be interrupted anymore, do they? We've, we've also gone from awareness marketing to context marketing with insights. Tony Hughes talks about leading with insights all the time. I think it's probably one of your favourite things, Tony, and it's quite right. How do you open with the right narrative? How do you carry that narrative forward? How do you make sure your buyer gets insights? Everybody knows that. We've also moved from being very inwardly focused. Most organisations that I talk to in my day-to-day -day, um, operations with clients, very inwardly focused, focused on delivery, focused on fulfilment, focused on volume metrics, the traditional sales volume metrics. That's the inside-out focus. We all need to step back, as I said before, zoom out and start to understand what the market's doing. Look over the horizon for those unanticipated needs. Be able to you know, see what the buyer really wants and that's the outside-in perspective that we need to get to. Transaction focus to value exchanges, thank goodness. We're finally getting to lifetime customer value as the important metric now. I think for far too long, certainly in my career across 28 years, it's all been sale, sale, sales. Revenue and quota and commission and all of that stuff that we're used to. Now we're a little bit more focused on the, on the buyer. We've gone from 100% outbound to a mixture now of creating inbound and certainly something that HubSpot does very well, that whole nurturing, creating conversion pathways. That's where we're headed. And we've gone finally from being data aware to being data and analytics driven. You've all seen some of Tony's posts probably. Uh, I know there's others that do as well, Kian as well. Um, the, the sales stack now, the technology stack, and we'll talk a bit more about that later. So you can see in the last 10 years, the balance of power really has shifted. Lots of change. I argue in the book that we've seen more change in the last 10 years than we've seen in the last 130 when it comes to B2B sales. If you take a look at what some of the big vendors are saying, with all of this change, I think comes opportunity. And Mr. Bezos at Amazon thinks that we're on the edge of a golden era, and I think he's right. Yes, there's a lot of change, there's a lot of technology impacting our roles and what we do, but certainly this creates opportunity as well. Artificial intelligence, cognitive computing, what the guys at IBM are doing. Anyone from IBM here? No. What they're doing at IBM right now with Watson is unbelievable. I'm sure you've all seen some of the um, amazing things that they can do with artificial intelligence, cognitive computing. Look at what they're doing at Microsoft, all about AI at scale, machine learning. This is the context that we're now living in. Oracle, although Mark Hurd's not there anymore, very focused on using analytics to give their salespeople the right tools to serve the customer in the moment. And of course, we've already heard from Salesforce, and I just mentioned to Bridget before, I was in Salesforce office in Melbourne um, last week looking at what they're doing with Einstein and mind-boggling. Um, predictive lead scoring and, and some of the artificial intelligence that Salesforce is now building with Einstein is set to change our roles even further. So, what's driving this change? And you think about some of these, these charts and, and um, where we are these days. The explosion of connectivity, the explosion of information is really what's driving a lot of this. And where we are today, where the red dot is in 2017, there's about 28.4 billion connected devices. We all know the Internet of Things is going to ramp that right up, and it is. So by 2020, we're looking at 50 billion connected devices. And you can see that trend line is just astonishing. So our use of data, our use of analytics, our use of connect connectivity is just going right off the charts now and when will continue into the future. If you think about how long it used to take an organisation to reach a market capitalisation of one billion, back in the old days a Fortune 500 company it would take you know, 20 years to get to one billion. Now here we are with Snapchat and WhatsApp in 2011 taking less than two years. So, you know, we're, we're, we've reached this point where we've got this unbelievable exponential growth. Um, you'll see in your packs that I've made a recommendation about some, some uh, reading that you should do. I read this book recently. Has anyone read this one, Exponential Organisations? If you haven't, do yourself a favour. Fabulous book. And Exponential Organisations is really the concept of the way some of these businesses these days are growing. If you look back through history and you smooth out all of the 
peaks and troughs in the business cycle, you know, you get what is fairly consistent linear growth. Nearly all of the benchmark index that we look at these days, if you look at things like Moore's Law, every 18 months computing power will, will double. It's always been fairly linear, fairly steady growth, hasn't it? Now we've got this thing happening where the businesses like Uber and Airbnb and you know, Salesforce themselves, a sort of growth that is just exponential growth. It's creating huge amounts of disruption, huge amounts of innovation. And as per my little diagram here, lots of VUCA. Everyone's heard the term VUCA. Volatility, uncertainty, complexity and amb ambiguity. A little bit overused these days, I think, that term. But what this exponential growth is causing is a real vacuum here between the traditional mainstream businesses and these, these exciting, unbelievable growth businesses that are just going off the charts. And this is, this is really causing some issue for all of us, in my opinion, because the mainstream businesses are now very focused on risk. They're very focused on driving cost out of their businesses. They have to. They're worried about disruption. So this is something that I think in terms of context is really important for all of us to understand. The guy that wrote this book is a gentleman by the name of Salim Ismail, and he said rapid or disruptive change is something that large matrix organisations find very difficult. And I'm sure you'll all agree, um, if you work in most matrix style organisations, slow moving, the exponential organisations are creating a lot of pressure and a lot of disruption. So again, this is the context that we now live with. I'd like to now just quickly tell you a story about a light bulb moment in my career. And this is a meeting that occurred um, in 2010, so a little while back. But this is a meeting that actually changed my, the entire way I think about sales. Now, what makes it especially uh, interesting to tell this story this morning to you is that the account manager that was with me at this meeting is actually here in the room. Diana Buchanan's sitting up the back there. Diana works for BMC. Diana was my star account manager. And in 2010, Diana was the uh, account manager for one of our large customers. I was, I was the sales director at Attachmate. And for those of you that know Attachmate, we were a host connectivity company. Our fourth largest customer here in Australia was Qantas. Has anyone sold to Qantas? Tony has. Um, if you haven't, Qantas is probably the number one leading vendor basher. And you all know what I mean by vendor bashing, right? Um, they, they operate on razor thin margins like most airlines. And you know, each year Diana and I would go out for our annual maintenance and support agreement negotiation. And it would be basically a vendor bashing session. The procurement people would just kick the hell out of us and make it a real miserable meeting for us. So in 2010, uh, following, I think, three years of this vendor bashing that we'd endured, um, Diana and I are there with the procurement people again. And they started with the same thing. Um, they started complaining about everything we hadn't done in that year. And they must have caught me on a bad day or something. I, I don't know whether I was just tired or whatnot. But without even thinking, it just came out of my mouth. I said, for God's sake, do we have to go through with this rubbish? This is just a charade. Uh, Diana turned around and looked at me and, like as if she was going to kick me under the table. The people at Qantas all, all sort of went, you know, what are you, what's, he, what's he talking about? I said, you tell us you want partners, not suppliers, and yet when we try to get close, you keep us at arm's length. We're trying to deliver value as a vendor, and each time we do, we turn up to these meetings and you just complain all the time. I said, can't we just be adults about this? And with that, the head of procurement and vendor management was a lady by the name of Prue Jacobson. I don't know if any of you know Prue, but um, she's a lovely lady. She said, Graham, you're absolutely right. Let's call this meeting to a close. Uh, you and I need to go and have a coffee. And I thought, mm, I, might have, I might have overstepped the mark here. <laughs> so Di jumps in a cab. She goes home, back to, oh, sorry, back to the office. Um, and Prue and I go downstairs for a coffee. Prue says to me, now, Graham, you need to understand a few things. I'm like, OK, um, what have I done now? She said, I've been given a directive by the CEO that we need to do more business with less vendors. And I'd heard that before. I'm sure some of you have heard that before too. The concept of vendor rationalisation. 
She said, we arrange our vendor stack, our technology vendor stack, into three tiers. Has everyone heard the term vendor stack? Yep, a few. The vendor stack is the way most businesses arrange their vendors, and everyone's got a different view on how they do that. Qantas has a three-tier vendor stack. She took out a piece of paper and pen and she said, now, in tier one, we have nine strategic vendors. And Diana and I both knew who they were. It was IBM and Fujitsu and all the big strategic vendors. I said, okay, that's fine. She said, 87% of our annual spend goes through those nine tier one vendors. Now, at that time, Qantas for us was a $1 million account. So it was a reasonably large account for us. She said, in tier two, we have 13 vendors, so it was the likes of Oracle and Microsoft and some of the still tr strategic vendors, but tier two. And I knew where she was going. She said, you're in tier three with 363 other tier three vendors. Some single product vendors, but you know, we had one product in there that was reasonably strategic, but there was plenty of other. She said, now, the big challenge that you've got, Graham, is that I'm taking, I've been given the remit by the CIO to take the 363 in tier three back to 100. And I said, okay, what does that mean for us? Prue said, well, it means one of two things. Either you will be culled completely as a supplier to Qantas. In other words, we will find a substitute product from one of our tier ones, and they could have done that, right, Diana? They could have easily gone with IBM. They had a similar product. Or you will be forced to sell your product to Qantas via one of our tier ones. Now, either of those for me as the director of sales at our little vendor was a potential disaster. Certainly being culled from the vendor stack is a huge disaster, but if we have to start to sell our product into Qantas via a reseller model, hoping that we can get the attention of the, the, the tier one prime partner, that's a real, a real concern. So, I go home tail between my legs thinking, mm, this is not so good. I started, Di and I had a chat and I said, I wonder how many other customers are thinking along these lines. I wonder how many others are, are, are rationalising vendors. And so I started to interview a few more procurement people. I went to National Australia Bank. National Australia Bank, similar, three tier model, five vendors, 31 vendors in tier two, 1100 vendors in tier three. The guy at NAB says to me, I've been given the remit to take the 1100 back to 600. Again, more vendor rationalisation. Now, the reason I'm bringing this up is that just about everybody in, that, in the diagram before, the mainstream customers, they're all looking to drive cost out of their business, right? And in doing so, vendor rationalisation, or vendor management in general, is a huge problem for all of them. So my first book, I went out and researched and interviewed a lot of buyers, and every single one of them said, we are in some form of vendor rationalisation. So, what does that mean? What does that mean for us as salespeople? Think about it. It means that our markets, our territories, the target addressable market, the market sizing that we all do, I argue, is nowhere near as big as we think it is. Your territory, you think it's this wide? I'm telling you it's this wide. A lot of these customers are not permitted to buy from you. So, I go to Suncorp. I'm sitting in the Suncorp CIO's office up there in Brisbane. And I say, what are you doing around vendor rationalisation? He says, well, see, see behind me here, and it's an open plan glass area. He said, there's 17 full-time employees sitting behind me. And he said, those 17 full-time employees are focused on vendor management, contracts management only. I said, right, what does that mean? He said, well, those people just crunch contracts all day, every day. Terms and conditions, license agreements, contracts. That's a massive cost for our business, just having those, that many vendors that we're having to manage. They're not engaging with the vendors, they're just managing the contracts. So you can see even the, even the large, medium-sized organisations are having to drive this cost down. So again, I make the point, your territories are nowhere near as big as you think they are. And that's an important thing to consider. So, <clears throat> you'll see in your, um, in your handouts there, there's a little discussion document. We're gonna spend a minute now just having a bit of a think about some of the sorts of questions that you might need to ask your buyers <clears throat> right up front in the sales process. So just 
spend a minute or so making note of some questions that you would like to understand and we'll, <clears throat> we'll kick it around shortly just to see um, if we're all on the same page in terms of types of qualifying that you might ask. So just to reiterate that point, here's some direct quotes from those customers that I interviewed uh, around this topic of vendor rationalisation. Take a look at the one that Suncorp said here, we actively block off-panel purchases. So again, to reiterate that point, if you're not on their existing supplier list now, they will block you from getting on. So some of the sorts of questions that we need to ask, I think, are based around, you know, right up front in the qualifying phase, you know, do you accept new vendors? Spot on. Exactly right. So I've divided it up, and I'll get you a copy of all of this as well, divided the questions up into new customers and existing customers. So think about, you know, even if you're on the phone in that very first meeting, it wouldn't hurt to ask, listen, um, we don't currently supply you, Mr. Mr. Customer. Um, do you accept new vendors? If so, what's the process? Uh, what, what hurdles do we have to get through before you'll accept us as a vendor? Um, I often like to ask now, you know, could you give us an example, Mr. Customer, of an exemplary experience that you had with a, with a particular supplier? We would like to try and match that if we can. Yes. Wouldn't, wouldn't, you, um, wouldn't you rather know some of this up front before you start wasting time? I, I had a guy um, that I spoke to about a month ago who said, I was given the NAB account to try and get into NAB and my, my boss said to me, just shake the tree, kick down the door, get into NAB any way you can. He said, I spent 18 months trying to work you know, in the business units and work my way up. And he said, and I developed some relationships only to find that they put the, the hand out and said, sorry, we're rationalising, you can't get on the panel. So we have to be careful of this. Um, I've divided the questions slightly differently. If you're, an if you're an existing supplier, you still need to know where do we rank on the vendor stack? How do we protect ourselves as vendors? How do we move up the vendor stack, if that's even possible? These are some of the questions I think we should be asking right up front in the qualifying process. Any other thoughts up this end? Everyone's on the same page by the sound of it. Are people seeing this? Are you seeing this out there in the marketplace? Yep. Good to see. Okay. All right, so let's talk. We've, we've covered some, some sort of diverse ground there in terms of context, what we're all dealing with now as salespeople. Technology, we talked about exponential organisations and vendor rationalisation. The fact that most of our customers are now trying to drive cost out of their business, aren't they? So let's talk about the implications for us as salespeople and what that means today. I argue in the book, I'm not sure how successfully, but I argue anyway, that the role of the salesperson is diminishing. And I say that because when I look at what I've done for most of my career, it's been this, hasn't it? Allocated into a territory, salesperson manages all activities for the territory. Prospecting, um, opportunity identification, solution design, proposal, through to close. That's been the traditional role. With a little bit of help from marketing, that Chinese wall between sales and marketing, around some brand awareness and maybe a few leads. But effectively, the territory was managed and owned by the salesperson. Now, of course, we're moving towards digital campaign lead management, inbound, outbound, all of the artificial intelligence stuff that we were talking about before with the sales stack and the marketing technologies. We're moving to this new era where the role of sales is being squashed gradually, or it's changing. Some people say it's, it's becoming more of a specialist role, and it is. We're seeing a rise of inbound, um, inside sales versus outside sales. I think you've all probably heard the old thing about field sales was fine when the buyer resided out in the field. But the buyer doesn't reside in the field anymore, do they? They reside online. So we're, we're seeing a big change there as well. So when you look further into the future, I argue with account-based marketing and account-based selling, whether you think that's just jargon or not, doesn't matter. That's where it's headed. Buyers can self-serve more often nowadays. So the role of the salesperson, particularly the field salesperson, gets squashed even further meaning we all have to become specialists. And the division of labour for frontline staff will be spread across a specialist team. We'll have sales and marketing alignment, we'll have product management people, pre-sales, post-sales, with a real focus on customer experience. Depending on which analyst you believe, um, Forrester have said that that means that there'll be 24% of B2B salespeople, outside salespeople, 
whose roles will disappear by 2020. That seems high to me. 2020 is only three years away. If 24% of us are going to be losing our jobs by that time, that's, that's pretty quick. But when you consider that customers will manage 80% of their relationships without human interaction, a Gartner quote, then certainly it sounds possible. If buyers don't need us the way they used to, then certainly there'll be some change coming in the next few years. I think one of the other proof points here about the change or the implications for us is that the fact that more and more of us are underperforming, that is failing to meet or exceed quota. 63% according to Harvard, others say it's higher. I think CSO said it was 55%. Um, Objective Management Group says it's 85%. I don't know, what are you guys seeing? Are you seeing more and more underperformance? Is 63 about right in your organisations? More than, more than double, not hitting their quotas now? Yes? Is that an unrealistic setting of quotas though? Well, there's that as well. The question every salesperson wanted to say is <laughs> That's very true. Is that an unrealistic? Can you repeat the question? Yeah, so um, what? Can you repeat the question so I understand? Yeah, absolutely. So what was just said there is that um, is that an unrealistic setting of quota? And of course, in, in many cases it is. Um, for those of you that follow me on LinkedIn, I've, I've been writing fairly um, blunt posts about this recently where, you know, just taking a, a, an actual or a, an amount from the previous year and building in a 10% stretch target for the next year's quota and expecting everyone to hit their numbers is, is ridiculous. And frankly, it sets salespeople up to fail. So that's just my opinion on it. But certainly, when I started my career back in 2003 managing salespeople, um, my first job as a sales leader, we had, I think, two out of ten that didn't make their numbers, didn't make club. Now, you know, it's certainly more than that. It's more than double that they're not making club. So sales underperformance is real. Um, the other thing that is another proof point to me, and this is just absolutely absurd, is the average sales tenure. Um, would anyone like to have a guess at how long the average salesperson lasts in their job now? Two? 18 months? Six months. Six months. <laughs> Some of them are about six months, aren't they? According to Sales Hacker, it's 16.8 months. Now, consider this. Consider that the average time for onboarding and training now is about seven months. So you've gone through the recruitment process, you've identified your, your candidate, you've brought them on board, they start day one and then there's seven months before they reach maximum productivity. If they're gone, in 16.8 months, you've got 10 months to get any return out of that person, right? That is just absurd. And it's not sustainable, in my opinion. The other part, the other fact with that study that I read um, is that only 5% of salespeople stay in the same role for any more than three years. Again, if your organisation is suffering this constant sales staff turnover, we're going to talk about some of the costs of that shortly. <coughs> But certainly I think that's a proof point of the implications that, that are now happening. Are you seeing more and more of this sales staff turnover in your businesses? No? If you're not, that's good. We'll talk a bit more about that shortly. So, moving along, um, some recommendations. I think having collated a lot of this information and having you know, sifted through mountains of data, I think I've, I've come up with a couple of really important points that we all need to start to consider when we're building our, our buyer aligned sales processes. The first thing I want to talk about is culture because as Peter Drucker said many years ago, culture eats strategy for breakfast and that's 100% right. So when you look at the way most businesses arrange their, their sales organisations, their cultures, we tend to have, it, it'd be wrong to have a quadrant, wouldn't it? So we've got point solutions internally focused businesses down here, so transactional businesses. Commodity based sales approach, um, price focused, haphazard approach to sales, very reactive, bottom left, okay? That's the sort of culture I worked for a while ago. Not fun to be there. Then you've got in quadrant B, you've got people that say they're customer centric. How often do you hear, oh yes, we place the customer at the heart of everything we do? But then they go and ask their salespeople, where's your forecast? How many calls you've done this week? You know, what meetings have you got this week, et cetera? 
So it's all about sales, 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 nice people with little impact, and again, reactive. Where, of course, we need to get is a systems-based approach that can give us scale, leveraging all of the predictive analytics and the tools that we just talked about before, artificial intelligence. We need to become customer success focused and obsessed almost. Um, I often say to my clients, the ultimate aim really is to establish customer advocacy. That's the, that's the panacea. When you've got loyal customers and repeat business, customers that will actually go out and sell your products for you, that's the greatest thing you can have. The cheapest sales force you'll ever get are your customers, right? So, moving to an outside in perspective, moving to a real client focus, shared risk and reward with your, with your customers, you've all heard this before. Long term outlook, focus on retention, lifetime customer value becomes a real priority instead of just this churn and burn mentality that we've seen in the past. Teaching, not selling. I'm going to talk about that next. And as I mentioned, leveraging technology for personalised engagements. I'm sure you've all read, as I have on LinkedIn, everyone's talking about um, buying stage appropriate messaging. And that's really important too. So the number one recommendation is to have a think about your culture. What does your sales culture look like today? Where are you on this quadrant? Are you a customer success focused business or not? I think a lot of people pay lip service to the fact that they, they're customer centric, but in many cases they're not. So, as I say, the arrows indicate we've got to get ourselves up to there. Now, as part of that cultural thing, let's talk about this thing again, turnover reduction. When you look at the cost to replace a salesperson, some study that came out of the, the US recently said that it's $111,000 every time this happens. Uh, and that's only just separation costs, rehiring and retraining. When you look at the, the real opportunity cost each time a salesperson leaves your business, that becomes really staggering. Now, we all know that when a salesperson disengages, there's a period of some months, in some cases, where that person is disengaged. You might have them on a performance improvement plan, you might be managing them out of your business, whatever the scenario is, they are generally switched off, right? While they're disengaged, you've got lost sales and you've got lost sales due to underserved customers in that territory. When you start to factor all of that in, the opportunity cost with that, the rehiring, the retraining, lost sales due, due to the onboarding, if this happens here, Three months has gone by, your sales guys are asleep at the wheel effectively. It takes another six months to find someone to replace them, roughly, three to six. And then another seven months to onboard that person, train that person up again. That territory has had a major dip, hasn't it? We've all seen that before. And that looks like 13 months to me by the time you add six and seven together, much less the three that they were switched off. Imagine your territory, 13 months, customers being underserved, competitors swooping in and displacing you. That is just madness. One study said that that can cost somewhere in the order of a million dollars each time that happens. So again, I make the point here, turnover reduction, it's part of your culture, part of making sure you're not losing people all the time. It's incredibly expensive. And I think, I don't know why, but we've all just, most of our business leaders have accepted that this is just a part of doing business. Oh yeah, we, we turn salespeople over. Oh yeah, so and so has left, we've got another guy in. It's crazy, it's madness. And when you do the numbers, it doesn't stack up. I wanna talk about buyer journey mapping and Bridget, you alluded to this earlier as well and you know, everyone's talking about journey mapping. How many actually do this in your businesses? Map the buying journey, people done it? A few hands, I know you have Sam, you're the experts talk about you in a minute. Buyer journey mapping. Um, I'm doing this weekly now with my clients where you sit down and you actually say, okay, tell me the steps that your buyer goes through. Let's look at your target addressable market, your segmentation plan. Let's understand who they are. What do the buyer personas look like? And what's your ideal customer profile? Put those things on paper. Now let's put together a, a, a map of what your, your buyer goes through. Mem remembering of course that according to Chet Holmes at least, 3% of your target addressable market is actually in a buying window at any given time. Meaning, 
97% of our customers are in a status quo position. They're not ready to buy anything, they're not aware of a problem, they're not aware of a need, right? So it's critically important that we understand what are the steps and what's required, what are the messages that are required to get that person to move through the buying journey. With, again, the ultimate aim being how do we create loyal, happy customers that come back and buy more stuff, right? So once you've mapped out the buying journey, you start to look at the trigger events. What are the trigger events that move someone from one stage to the next? Understand what they look like. Social listening. You've all heard the term social listening, using Google Alerts and Trapit and various other tools now that give you insights into what might be happening with your buyer. How do you get the buyer from a window of discontent to awareness? And normally that's bad experiences, changes or transitions, maybe a senior leader's change that might be a, a, a trigger event that leads you to believe that there's an opportunity, or just changes in awareness, a new piece of legislation, whatever it might be. Then you start to look at, okay, well, what are the, what are the messaging, key messaging elements across the journey? Um, if you just look at the three areas, awareness, consideration, purchase, you might say, okay, well, in this section of the buying journey, we've got this particular set of content. It might be educational content, e-books, white papers, etc. You map that all out. You do the same in the next set. It might be a, a, a slightly different approach. You might have podcasts, video. When you start to map all of that out across the journey, you can start to understand what the sales process really looks like. Then, of course, the next layer is tools and technologies, and we all know there's a lot more of that available these days. And I'm not suggesting for a second that these are the tools that you need to use, or, or in this quantity even, but certainly there are a range of tools that can help the buying journey, progress the buying journey. Once you've done that, and this can all be done on one page, it's not hard to do. Once you've done that, you can then map the touch points. Which leads me to the gentleman sitting over here, the number of gentlemen sitting over there with those HubSpot t-shirts on. Um, I've got to tell a story about my engagement with HubSpot. And I'm not, by the way, right up front, I'm not being paid a single cent to endorse HubSpot. This is just credit where credit's due. So mid last year, um, for my own business, I was looking at marketing automation technology. Um, I'd heard about HubSpot but didn't know anything about it, really what it was. I was on Twitter, I saw something, a post about HubSpot, I read it, I thought that, that sounds very interesting. So I jumped on their website. I downloaded a white paper knowing full well that I would get a call from someone at HubSpot because I've just downloaded a white paper. Sure enough, the next day, this gentleman calls me. This gentleman's name is Jack Doran. And uh, Jack's another mad Irishman, Ken. And uh, Jack calls me and he says, hi, I've just had a look at your website um, and thanks for downloading that white paper. Um, he said, love to uh, talk to you a bit more about your marketing automation requirements. He said, I'm an inbound marketing specialist. Anyway, the phone call unfolded. Jack was very polite and pleasant and and he was really just using the time to educate me. And um, being the sales guy that I am, I, had, I still had the sales cap on, even though I was a buyer. And I was sitting there thinking, as the call went on, I was thinking, this guy's hopeless. He's got, he's got no idea. I haven't had any spin model questions. There's been no band questions. He hasn't asked for a compelling event. He hasn't asked about budget, time frames, process. He hasn't asked any of that. I'm thinking, this guy's no good. He doesn't know what he's doing. But in fact, it was me that was being stupid. What Jack was doing was just educating me. And he did a brilliant job. The call was extremely refreshing for me as a salesperson. It was just, you know, let me know what I can do to help you. Then I started to realise that this is actually the HubSpot model. In fact, I read um, not long after, Sam, that uh, Brian Halligan <coughs> put that quote out about, you know, create value before you go and extract value. And that's the whole ethos of HubSpot, right? So then I went out and bought the book, The Sales Acceleration Formula, which is recommended. Great book. Mark Robage is the gentleman that built the HubSpot sales model from the ground up. And I noticed that here's this HubSpot buying journey in the book. I pinched this from the book, Sam, I hope you don't mind. Hope Mark doesn't mind. That is the HubSpot buying journey, all nicely mapped out. And the penny dropped. The penny dropped that Jack had actually just taken me through this process. 
Six months later, I'm a customer of HubSpot. My business now uses HubSpot thanks to these touch points that were very clearly identified and, and, and utilised by Jack. Um, each of those touch points had some content attached to it. So, you know, the initial seeing it on Twitter, followed by um, the phone call, followed by another download, followed by an email with some more content. It was all very predictable once I understood this. But as a buyer, it just felt like I was being educated. It was a really well done approach. Yeah, it certainly did. And, it, it, you know, for a long term salesperson, 28 years, having been trained in sales process to all of a sudden be a buyer and understand, no, this is a buying journey. It's a totally different mindset. Tony talks about mindset a lot. And this is what I'm talking about in changing your culture. I know the guys at Salesforce do it brilliantly as well. I'm, a, I'm now a Salesforce customer. Um, same, same approach. Map out the buying journey, understand the messages, understand the tools and the touch points, and the sales process becomes so much easier. You're not having to second guess or try and push the customer through a journey. It's all, it's all about education. Moving right along, um, the final recommendation. For those of you that are quota carrying salespeople, you absolutely have to specialise these days. Um, the overwhelming feedback that I got from the research phase of both books in talking to buyers is that we no longer value salespeople who can't tell us something we don't already know. I mean, it's obvious, isn't it? Um, if you're not bringing insights or new value to your buyer, then they won't spend five minutes with you. Who's finding it difficult to get meetings these days? Meetings with buyers. How difficult? It used to be you'd pick up the phone. When I first started selling in, in IT, I could pick up the phone and say, Hi, <coughs> Graham Hawkins from CompuWare here. I'm going to be in your area next Wednesday. Love to come and chat to you about your file and data management. Yes, Mr. Vendor, come on in. You know, they'd roll out the red carpet. Not anymore. They've got access to that information. They know as much as you do in some cases, sometimes more. So, you know, we've got to specialise. And the way we specialise, which I outline in detail in the book, is around these five key areas. You've got to understand your career direction. You've got to look at where you are in terms of your passion, where your customers are, where your market might be growing. Um, it's, it's really, if you're not bringing commercial insights to your buyer, you just won't get their attention at all. So all of us as salespeople, the challenge is specialise. You can't be a generalist anymore. You can't be a walking brochure. I had one customer say to me, we go into salesperson avoidance mode. The moment a salesperson sounds like they're just, you know, a walking brochure. Those days are over. So, in summary, I think we're on time, are we, Tony? In summary, don't assume that everyone can buy from you. Have a think about that vendor rationalisation thing. And, I, you know, go and talk to some customers. If you don't believe me, just ask your buyers. They are all trying to drive those single product vendors out of the business. They are trying to put more and more of their spend, their annual spend, through strategic partners. The Accenture Procurement Strategy Report of 2016 says very clearly that buyers will basically coalesce around a small number of strategic buy, uh, suppliers to drive risk and cost out of their business. That's happening. Change your culture. You've got to get your culture to become focused on customer success like the guys at Salesforce, like the guys at HubSpot and various others. I'm sure you, many of you are doing it as well, but see if you can get away from being focused on sales. I always say that a sale is just something that happens naturally as a result of being immersed in, your, in helping your buyer. Once you do that, you have, the rest of it follows along. The turnover reduction thing, again, huge savings to be made here. If, you, if you're finding in your businesses that you're turning over stale staff constantly, then just have a bit of a look at the cost. When you add up the real cost, you wouldn't let salespeople go. And if you're, I hate to say it, there's no one in this room that does this, but any of those lazy sales managers out there that just after three months pigeonhole someone by saying, yeah, he's no good or she's no good, we'll have to manage them out. That's just lazy. Start coaching, start mentoring, start developing those people. Bring the bottom performers up, range management. And map the buying journey. <coughs> That's pretty straightforward and pretty simple to, to understand, I think. And of course, for salespeople, we, we all need to specialise. 
So I'll leave you very quickly with this one. If you don't like change, then you're going to like irrelevance even less. We, we, all, we all need to change and we need to change rapidly. I think that's the key message. I think you all get that, but hopefully there's been um, at least four recommendations there that you can take back to your businesses and hopefully uh, implement as soon as you can. Back to you, Tony. Graeme, thank you. Let's give him a round of applause.